Welcome to The Mentored Engineer. In this video, we're gonna talk about getting section moduluses from 3D CAD. In specific, we're gonna talk about doing it in SOLIDWORKS. All right, now, while I'm de demonstrating everything here in SOLIDWORKS, you can pretty much get this from any uh, 3D CAD system that is out there. They, they pretty much all do this. Uh, so it's just a matter of uh, finding out how to do it in your specific uh, 3D, solid, uh, 3D CAD system. So if you don't have SOLIDWORKS, you just might want to look in your the help section of your particular 3D CAD, or perhaps YouTube has a video on it somewhere to help you. Okay, so we're just going to go through the functions and uh, show you exactly how to do this. So I've got certain shapes here, the first of which is a round circle. And to get the section properties on here, I'm going to select the surface I am interested in. And in SOLIDWORKS, you can do this one of three ways. Uh, the first one is to go to the command manager and to click on the evaluate tab. And then right here is section properties. And it pulls up a dialog box. All right, the second way is to go to tools and go down to the evaluate uh, pop up here and then say section properties. Or you can do what I've done and uh, program it to be the letter R under uh, tools and customize and then you can go to the keyboard tabs. All right, so right here you can see we have this pop-up. If I didn't select this face, um, I could go ahead and select it there and then hit recalculate. If I'm in assembly, I can select multiple faces as long as they're all on the same plane. All right, so it tells me a bunch of stuff. The first thing it tells me is the area of that surface, which is 5.3 inches squared. So that's always a nice thing to have. Um, the next thing it does is tell me where this surface is in my relative coordinate plane, as far as where the centroid ends up. Okay, since it's a circle and I drew it about the origin here, it's gonna put its axis there, so it's zero, inches in the X and you'll look down here in the bottom left hand corner for your X dimension, your Y dimension, and your Z dimension. All right, and it's saying it's on center X and Y, which makes sense. And then it's six inches from the center of the tube to the end of it. So this must be a 12 inch tube. Let's see if that's right. Oops, didn't like that while I'm in there. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out some other time. So the next thing it does is it calculates what the IXX, IYY, and IZZ are. Okay, so IXX is bending about the X one, so this would be uh, bending this, the tube, this way. Uh, the IYY would be bending it side to side, and the IZZ would be putting a torque end to end on this. Okay, so since it is a perfectly symmetrical tube, we get an I, XX and an IYY that are the same of 30.23. Now, the torsional one, as we mentioned in our uh, stress flow class, is going to be the sum of those in uh, to get our polar moment of inertia. In this case, it's 60.47. So that is 30.23 times 2, and then you get some rounding here and there. Uh, no big deal. And it says here that uh, specifically the polar moment of inertia at the centroid is 60.47 inches. All right. Uh, then we have what the axis is, or the angle between the axis uh, is the zero degrees. And that's, that's okay. We'll come to that and why it's different in just a second. Uh, and then it gives us the principal moments of inertia, which is the same as the IXX and IYY. Okay, so this last box in the uh, section properties is kind of useless. I've used it uh, once or twice in my engineering career. It's not very uh, popular, but it's the uh, area moment of inertia about the, uh, the coordinate system that you started the whole part from. And most of the time, which we don't care, because we're just looking for a specific section, and we're looking at the centroid of that section. So in this case, it is uh, just moving the section from the middle of this tube, where the origin is, out six inches to this surface. So the formula for this is the, the ex, uh, existing moment of inertia plus the area of that section 
times the distance to that plane squared. So in this case, it was six inches squared times the area, which is 5.3 inches, plus the original 30.23 inches, and you get 221.09 uh, inches to the fourth. All right, not very useful, okay? So let us close this one and go into something where uh, we start getting a little bit different uh, dimensions here. Okay, so here's a rectangular tube with the centroid uh, on our X and Y, uh, just like we would have. We're gonna flip that on. Once again, we get our area, 3.52 inches, and we find out that our Z coordinate is three inches from the center. So this must be a six inch tube. All right, and we find out that uh, our moment about the tall dimension, our strong axis is what I like to call it, is 17.44 uh, inches cubed, or inches to the fourth. And then bending in the weak axis is 9.32 inches to the fourth. All right, we could probably guess that. And uh, when we add those together to get our polar moment of inertia, and remember this only works for closed section, cross sections, uh, we get 26.76 uh, inches to the fourth, which is the sum of the other two. Okay, if we look at the other ones, uh, it kind of just goes through uh, the other stuff, and we see that our principal moment of inertia are exactly what we have uh, up above. And then we can get the uh, moment of inertia from our output coordinate system as well. Now let me show you how that changes when we make a simple change. All right, I've changed my configuration here, moving my so solid up from the centroid of the tube to the bottom. All right, let's see what changes now. All right, same area, same moments of inertia at the centroid, so it doesn't matter in the whole real world space of what it exists at at that point. Uh, we just care at that very surface, where's the centroid, okay? And now it gives us information up here that our Y is three inches off. All right, so we're gonna wanna take note of that. Our polar moment of inertia is here, same as what's up here. And you see these numbers have changed and we've actually added in uh, some new numbers here uh, of what we would do if we were rotating about um, different axes. Uh, I don't wanna go into that. It really isn't helpful and it doesn't really show us anything new. So we're not gonna talk about uh, those other ones. But you can see it did change everything down here uh, than what it was before. Okay, let's go on to a unsymmetrical shape. This right here is a standard Z channel. And we're gonna take our section modulus again. And we got our area, we've got our uh, output coordinate system and how much is different. Uh, have it symmetric about the top and bottom here. And now we have, we have other numbers here. Look at this, 1.5 or negative 1.5. And that is calculating what's going on with this random arbitrary um, coordinate system I put in here. The other ones, because they were symmetric models, uh, used just the X and Y, uh, they have a strong axis and a weak axis. Uh, so what it'll, what it'll do is it'll attempt to find out where the maximum moment of inertia is on this and orient the, their coordinate system there. Now we are not concerned with this in most cases. Uh, what we we'll wanna do is always, always, always look up here for our moments of inertia at the centroid in the straight up and down X and Y coordinates. Uh, in which case it is 3.7 and 1.0 and a polar moment of inertia of 4.7. Now it's also saying, hey, this angle between the coordinate system I put in and the coordinate system you put in 
is 65.8 degrees. And I can look at this model and say, yeah, that's, that's probably close to 65.8 degrees. I'm gonna look X here um, to Y there. Uh, about, yeah, about that dimension. Uh, but then it gives us the principal moments of inertia, and that's the moments of inertia at this maximum here, where my uh, YY is 4.4. Uh, I'm bending uh, about the, the farthest tip to tip, basically. Bending about uh, that one so that they would have the most tension and compression loads. And then the XX uh, really doesn't have much section because a lot of it's on or near the neutral axis. Okay, but we don't really use that much. Uh, so I just kind of throw it away. And then you can see here that our moments of inertia about the output coordinates are much different here. Uh, but like I said, I rarely if ever use those. Okay, now let's go to something that's a little bit more complex and go to a T. Now it's just a standard structural T here. And I'm gonna have select my uh, mass, or sorry, I'm gonna select my area moment of inertia here. And I've got my uh, area of 8.5 inches squared. And I've got a Y here of 6.3 inches. Now that's gonna come in handy in just a second. And I've got all my moments of inertia here. And we're gonna keep those uh, just like they are. All right, so what we're gonna do is make a sketch on this surface. All right, we got our sketch and we're gonna put a point right here at 6.7. And that will tell us our uh, dimension of C. Now, if we're interested in going from the centroid to let's say this point or the top surface, uh, we can figure out what those are just by using the sketch and putting that in there. So if our uh, uh, coordinate system was further up here or at the top surface, at this corner, anywhere else, we could come back and find out where the centroid is from that point and then figure out what our C is for bending. Okay, and the last thing I wanna show you is if you have a coordinate system or a part here where uh, I have another flange in here that I've added and it's just in there for a little bit. I can't grab it from either end of the model. And all I wanna do is uh, figure out what that is. So what I can do is I usually just come in here at a random spot and make a sketch I usually don't even constrain the sketch because I'm going to delete it pretty soon. And then uh, make a cut through all. All right, and now I can select my surface. I can go in and look at my uh, moment of uh, area moment of inertia properties and figure out. Uh, well, that's my my strong axis bending moment. This would be up the up and down if I'm trying to bend it in that direction. I uh, get 84.4 and I know it's 5.9 inches from the top of the beam. So at this point I can go in here. I can uh, make another sketch. And I make this uh, 5.9. So I did move it down about 0.6 inches, adding that little flange in there. And I can get my distance from the uh, centroid to the top and bottom. I can get it from any of the other coordinates. So that's how I use sketches there. Uh, where this really comes in helpful is when you have an assembly and you are trying to figure out exactly where uh, uh, you, need, you need a section at exactly the right spot and you can go in and just make a cut through all the parts you like Calculate that section out real quick Figure out your stress and then uh, go ahead and delete those functions or just suppress them uh, a lot of times, you know, just 
makes it go real quick if you can keep those. So if you change the section, uh, you do that. Uh, you can you can take as many sections as you want very quickly. Uh, just make sure before you release the part for production, you actually take those out. So that is how you get section properties in SolidWorks. Uh, we hope you do this often, and thank you for watching this video.